EWTN's Cathedrals Across America presents from the Saints Peter and Paul Cathedral in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, the Mass of Ordination and Installation of Monsignor Jerome Fujio as the Sixth Bishop of St. Thomas.
with great joy this day to welcome a new pastor and shepherd. We do so because of God's goodness to all of us. Let us ask the Father now to forgive our sins.
reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the lowly, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a diadem instead of ashes, to give them oil of gladness in place of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a listless spirit. The word of the Lord.
reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, I remind you to stir into flame. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Every high priest is taken from among men and made their representative before God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal patiently with the ignorant and erring, for he himself is beset by weakness and so, for this reason, must make sin offerings for himself as well as for the people. No one takes this honor upon himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, it was not Christ who glorified himself in becoming high priest, but rather the one who said to him, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. Just as he says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days when he was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, declared by God high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Jesus had received, revealed himself to his disciples and eaten breakfast with them, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He then said to Simon Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. He said this, signifying that what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord.
Your Eminence, the Church of St. Thomas asks you to ordain this priest, Reverend Monsignor Jerome Fujio, to the responsibility of the Episcopate. Have you a mandate from the Apostolic See? We have. Then let it be read. Your Eminence, Cardinal Gregory, Your Eminence, Cardinal O'Malley, Your Eminence, Cardinal Wuerl, Your Excellency, Bishop Bevar, Bishop-elect Feggio, my brother as bishops and bishops, your priests, deacons, consecrated religious, and lay faithful of the family of God in this Diocese of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. To all of you, Et je veux aussi saluer tous ceux qui, du Cameroun, nous sont ici présents ou nous regardent. J'espère que vous êtes présents. My feeling is that there is nobody else than Cameroon is here. <laughs> But you know, I would like also to remember the people in Fonakoke. Well, you know, you know what? Tout le Cameroun est content aujourd'hui, n'est-ce pas? Tous, pas seulement vous. <laughs> So, Your Excellency, Bishop Elec Feggio, I am truly pleased to be with you and the people of St. Thomas. Are you are ordained to the fullness of the priesthood and begin your Episcopal ministry here as ordinary, having worked as close collaborator with Cardinal O'Malley. He is here, by the way. <laughs> Do you remember him? Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> then Bishop Elliot Thomas, who is with God. But you remember him also. <laughs> Bishop George Murray, also with God. And most recently with Bishop Beva. We thank him. You have been serving in nearly every key post in this diocese, including Vicar General and Rector of this cathedral. Having left your native Cameroon to serve as a missionary here, you understand the critical need for a renewed missionary and evangelical effort. So now it's in your hands. You understand that? Yes. All of you. And also, I would like to remember Bishop Edward Herper, which is Herper, the first, the first bishop of this diocese. Herper, Herper. Although you have assisted the shepherd of this diocese, the Holy Father has now called you to be the chief shepherd here and asks you to take risks in imitating the heart of the Redeemer. Allow me to make a quotation from Pope Francis. Such is a heart that seeks out, a heart that does not set aside times and space as private. Woe to those shepherds who privatize their ministry. It is not jealous of its legitimate quiet time, even that and never demands that it be left alone. This is for Francis speaking, huh? we have to listen. A shepherd after the heart of God does not protect his own comfort zone. He is not worried about protecting his good name but will be slandered as Jesus was. Unafraid of criticism, he is disposed to take risks in seeking to imitate his Lord." End of quote. As we continue, 
to rejoice in our risen Lord and confident in the gifts and ta talents that God has bestowed upon you, I command you to send Peter and Paul uh, who preached the gospel to the ends of the earth and who bore witness to the Lord, offering their lives as a pleasing holocaust at home, trusting that you will show forth to the flock in St. Thomas that mercy which flows from the heart of the Redeemer. Finally, I would be remiss again if I did not express my and your gratitude to Bishop Herbert Bevard, who guided his, this diocese faithfully from 2008 until his retirement last year, but he is still with, you, with us today. Your Excellency, thank you again. And now, with great joy, I will read the Apostolic Letter of Appointment. This letter is written in Latin. This is a translation. It will be shown to you later by the bishop-elect. Francis, bishop, servant of the servants of God. To our beloved son, Jerome Feggio, from the clergy of the Diocese of St. Thomas and until now Vicar General there and Rector of the Cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul, appointed Bishop of the same see, greetings and apostolic blessing. Foreshadowed by many events of the Old Testament and established by Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church diligently proclaims the good news to those searching for God and through the ministry of bishops and priests offers to them the blessing of eternal salvation. Consequently, the principal and complete responsibility of the Roman Pontiff in his administration for the Universal Church of the, those matters pertaining to instruction and guidance throughout the world demands that suitable shepherds be appointed to dioceses lacking an ordinary. For this reason, we, at this time, direct our attention to the community of St. Thomas, which, owing to resignation of our venerable brother Herbert Bevard, stands in need of its own rightful bishop. And so, beloved son, we have decided to entrust this office to you, given that you are outstanding in spiritual life, practical experience, sound faith, scholarship, charity, and effective pastoral works. Therefore, upon consultation with the Congregation for Bishops, from the fullness of our apostolic authority and by virtue of this letter, we appoint you Bishop of the Diocese of St. Thomas, conferring upon you the rights and obligations which belong to this mission. You may receive Episcopal ordination anywhere outside the city of Rome from the, any Catholic bishop, the liturgical norms being observed. However, prior to this, as established by ecclesiastical law, you must make the profession of faith and take the oath of fidelity toward us and our successor in this see. Finally, it is our heartfelt desire that you ardently carry out your ministry to teach the Catholic faith and to safeguard its doctrine under the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is not only an example for the whole Church in the exercise of divine worship, but is also clearly a teacher of the spiritual life for individual Christians. Given at Rome, in Rome, at the Lateran, on the second day of March, in the year of the Lord, 2021, the eighth of our pontificate, and it is signed Francis.
Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Your Excellency, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, it's a great honor to be in your presence as you're here representing our beloved Holy Father, Pope Francis. Please tell him how grateful we are for the new Bishop of the Virgin, of the Virgin Islands. Cardinal Gregory, Cardinal Wuerl, Archbishop Gonzalez, Bishop Campbell, I know you all join me in thanking Bishop Vavard for his loving service of the people of the Virgin Islands, and we pray for your good health and in retirement. I want to welcome uh, our governor, lieutenant governor, and president of the, of the Senate who are here present for this uh, very wonderful occasion. So many priests and deacons, religious, and brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we are all so happy to be here to accompany Monsignor Jerome on this is ordination day, a very important event in the life of our church. You know, when you talk to people around the world about the Virgin Islands, they often say, oh, that's the famous uh, honeymoon spot, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, my little sister came here on her honeymoon. And I like to tell people that of my 37 years as a bishop, I spent my honeymoon here in the Virgin Islands. And... Uh, And it's so wonderful to be back with all of you on this very happy occasion. In 1992, we were celebrating the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Christopher Columbus to the Virgin Islands. He named the islands in honor of St. Ursula and the 11,000 virgins because he saw so many islands and they were so beautiful. Well, as part of that 500th anniversary celebration, there was many, many activities that were held. And actually, uh, there was a commemorative stamp issued in Washington and also in Italy, the native country of Christopher Columbus. And a wonderful celebration was held on St. Croix at Columbus Landing. And we were accompanied there by the heads of state of many of the Caribbean countries, the Councilor Corps from St. Thomas, and the head of the Italian Postal Service who came with a huge poster of this magnificent stamp issued in honor 
of Columbus's arrival in the Virgin Islands. And I'll never forget, he held up this magnificent stamp. The Italians have the most beautiful stamps in the world. And he said, it took Columbus three months to cross the Atlantic, but now your letters with this stamp can arise from Rome, and somebody said, in three months. <laughs> But I must say, the head of the Italian Postal Service was overwhelmed by the beauty of the Virgin Islands. And he said to me, Excellenza, he said, you have chosen such a beautiful place to be bishop. I said, I didn't choose anything. I said, the Pope sent me here. He said, oh, the Pope is infallible. <laughs> Well, I'm sure that's the way we all feel today, that Pope Francis has wisely chosen a faithful priest who has dedicated his entire priestly ministry to the beautiful people of the Virgin Islands. In today's world, the office of bishop is not well understood. One man was quoted as saying, the only bishop I know is on my chessboard. In light of the award-winning series, The Queen's Gambit, people are focused more on that chess piece shaped like a miter and called the bishop. I won't give any mystical interpretation to the diagonal movement of that chess piece. One chess manual urges the reader to use the bishop sparingly, saving him for the heroic deeds of the end game. Monsignor Jerome, we are expecting many heroic deeds from you as our new bishop, but not just at the end game. St. Teresa of Avila was also a great fan of chess and saw in this game a metaphor about the spiritual life. She said the goal of the spiritual life is to capture the king. In our quest to capture the king, the role of the bishop is crucial. One of the most important things that the Catholic Church does is to make bishops. Bishops who can link us with the apostles and with Christ himself, and that allows us to be a Eucharistic people. And without the Eucharist, how sad, how empty the world would be. I'm sure that we can all identify with that powerful testimony of Emeritus and the martyrs' companions who were killed by the Emperor Diocletian. He said when they were persecuted for having secret masses in their homes, he said, sine domenico non possimus, without Sunday we cannot live, without the Eucharist we cannot survive. An affirmation that's sorely tested by this pandemic. Jesus founded his church on the apostles, the first bishops. Many of them were simple fishermen, ill-prepared for the task that Jesus gave them. They became vessels of clay, bearing treasures, carrying the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth and witnessing to that truth of their preaching by gladly shedding their blood in witness to the gospel. The gospel reading this morning, which the liturgy proposes for us, presents the Lord questioning Peter, the head of the apostles. The apostles were the first bishops, but they were not the last. They are the beginning of the vocation of bishop in the church. Peter had a three-year seminary formation leading up to his Episcopal ordination at the Last Supper. It was an accelerated course, a sort of night school, with Peter working and fishing and helping Jesus, and the whole time being prepared by the Lord to be a bishop. I like to think that Peter was an A student, 
we can surmise that because of the correct answers that he gives in the three examinations that Jesus subjected him to in the course of his training. As we prepare to ordain a new bishop 2,000 years later, the same examinations, the same questions, have great validity and perhaps are even more crucial. The three exams of Peter the Apostle are quite applicable to any candidate to be ordained a bishop. Jesus was a great teacher, but I don't think he liked correcting exams, so he kept them very short. The first exam took place at Caesarea Philippi, surrounded by the temples of pagan gods, where Jesus says, whom do the people say the Son of Man is? In the apostles, they go through the multiple choice of the usual suspects. Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But the next question gets very personal. Who do you say that I am? And it's Peter who answers, says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Bingo. The correct answer. The answer is faith in Jesus Christ, true God and true man. In a world of unbelief, the bishop needs to be a man of faith who can assure people, we're not here by accident. We're here because of a loving God who created us, redeemed us, and gave us a mission. Pope Paul VI once said, more than teachers, the world needs witnesses. When they're looking for a replacement for Judas, part of the job description was to be a witness of the resurrection. Jerome, you are being called to be a teacher of the faith and a witness that Jesus Christ is risen and walks among us. Jesus is some, not some guru from the distant past. He is our contemporary, and the bishop's words and deeds must proclaim before the world that our Redeemer lives and walks among us. In the past, the church was often persecuted because of what we taught about Christ, his two natures, the virginity of Mary, the efficacy of the sacraments, the infallibility of the Pope. Today, so often the attacks on the church come because of the church's teaching about the dignity in each of every human being, the centrality of life and the church's social gospel. Of all of these truths, you must be a herald, proclaiming the good news with clarity, with enthusiasm, and with joy. When the first bishops ordained the first deacons, they gave us as the rationale, well, the bishops, the apostles, needed more time for prayer and for preaching. As a man of faith, the bishop is called to be a man of prayer, to have a deep and intimate knowledge and friendship with Jesus Christ that can then be communicated by your authenticity, your witness, your preaching, your sharing your own intimate faith life. The second examination that Peter the bishop takes is in the synagogue at Capernaum, which we read about in chapter six of John's gospel, where Jesus gives us that beautiful Eucharistic discourse that I am the bread of life come down from heaven. I once had the joy of gathering in that synagogue with my priests from Boston for a retreat where we prayed and sang hymns and re read Jesus's sermon on the bread of life. In his powerful sermon, Jesus is promising us the Eucharist, the great gift that is a gift of himself. The same gospel recounts 
how some of the disciples rejected Christ's words and could not accept his promises. In fact, it's this same gospel that references the betrayal of Judas. Here we find the second exam for the new bishops. Jesus says, will you also abandon me? In a world where many people have put their trust in science, in politics, and in money, discipleship is always about putting our trust in Jesus and in his promises. And when many are rejecting Jesus' promises and have lost hope in his words, Peter once again gets an A plus with his response. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter's response is one of hope amidst many who have lost hope. The same St. Peter later writes in his epistle, Sanctify the Lord Jesus in your hearts, being ready always to satisfy everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. In a world where there is so much despair, where so many people are stepping away, abandoning Christ, we need our bishops to be men of hope, leading people to a place where they can trust in the loving and powerful promises of our Savior. Like Peter, we need the bishop to be a man of faith and a man of hope. And now we come to the final exam, the episode that we heard in today's gospel. I like to refer to it as the last breakfast. The apostles were not great fishermen. They never seemed to catch anything unless Jesus was right there saying, throw the nets here now. And so our feckless fishermen apostles had toiled the whole night and caught nothing. But now the risen Lord has arrived and everything changes for the better. And when Peter arrives at the shore, he found Jesus cooking. It's the only instance where the scriptures hint at Jesus' culinary prowess. Obviously, the Blessed Mother gave him a few tips in the kitchen, but... It's in the context of a breakfast that consists not just in the fresh fish resulting from Jesus' latest miracle, but in part of the menu was the bread. We see the strong Eucharistic symbolism in this passage. And it's here that Peter the bishop takes his final exam. Once again, it's short. Indeed, one question repeated three times. But it's the most important question of all. St. John of the Cross says that at the end of our lives, we will be examined in love. And in today's gospel, Peter is being examined in love. Do you love me? Jesus asked three times as if to erase the three denials of when Peter in his fragile humanity succumbed to fear when confronted not by a Roman centurion with a big spear but by a waitress with an attitude. Peter is ashamed. He's embarrassed. He's acutely aware of his human limitations. But he loves Jesus. And the correct answer is, Jesus, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And it's then that Peter receives his commissioning. Feed my sheep. Jerome, my brother, today you are being commissioned, ordained, anointed to care for the Lord's flock. Jesus is asking you the same questions that he asked his first bishops. Who do you 
you say that I am? Are you going to abandon me like so many others? Do you love me? Like Peter, you must be able to respond, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, a response of faith. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, a response of hope. Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee, a response of love. After examining Peter in love, and charging him to feed the flock and to lay down his life. Then Jesus invites Peter once again with those words that echo throughout the history of the church, follow me. The invitation is to follow Jesus, not as Peter did when he fled Gethsemane and tried to follow at a safe distance. But now Jesus invites Peter to follow up close in an unswerving discipleship all the rest of his days. Jesus is teaching us that ministry is about love, about mercy, about laying down one's life for the flock. And that ministry is born out of a deep friendship with the risen Lord. Peter and the apostles lived out their vocation, feeding Christ's flock and confirming the faith, making the good shepherds love present to God's people. The gift of ministry does not end with the apostles, but has been passed on by the laying on of hands and the gifts of the Spirit. Today, in the presence of this faith community, Jerome will receive the same ordination and sharing in the apostles' role. Jesus is calling this man to follow him and to be a shepherd after his own heart by the sacrament of orders. Without bishops in the lineage of the apostles, there would be no priests, no magisterium, no power to forgive sins, no possibility of Eucharist. And that is why the church sees the ordination of a bishop as something so key in our identity as Catholics. It's a way that Christ's loving plan continues to unfold through history. The ordination speaks to us about the meaning of the sacrament. The rite calls for a ring to be placed on the bishop's finger. It's a wedding ring. The bishop represents Christ, the divine bridegroom, and the church is entrusted to him. The bishop's ordination contains so many phrases that talk about being a wedding. Like the bridegroom and father of the family, the bishop must have a special love for all of God's people. And the ritual ordination speak to us about the role of the bishop. Father Jerome, you are to pray always for and with your people as a father and a brother to love all those whom God places in your care. Love your priests and deacons who share with you the ministry of Christ. Love the poor and the infirm, the strangers and the homeless, and seek out the sheep who have strayed. The lost sheep is the priority of Jesus. Along with the mitre, a wedding crown, you will be given a staff, the bishop's crozier. You are to be an icon of the good shepherd. And like the good shepherd who knows his sheep and is known by them, and who does not hesitate to lay down his life for them. And Bishop Jerome, whenever you look back on this day, recall the charge of Paul to Timothy. I remind you to stir into flame the gifts of God you have received through the imposition of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power and love and self-control. Bear your share of the hardship of the gospel with the strength that comes from God. And remember always that your ministry is above all a call to follow Jesus Christ. You responded generously years ago by embracing a vocation to the priesthood. Today is a second call like Peter's. 
You're being called to a deeper conversion, a vocation of love and service. We commend your ministry to the loving care of Our Lady of Perpetual Help, that through her intercession, the grace of this ordination, God may grant you a heart according to the heart of Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve, and who laid down his life for his flock. Amen. Amen. brother. The ancient rule of the Holy Fathers ordains that a bishop-elect is to be questioned in the presence of the people on his resolve to uphold the faith and to discharge his duty. And so, dear both brother, do you resolve by the grace of the Holy Spirit to discharge until death the office entrusted to us by the apostles? which we are about to pass on to you by the laying on of our hands. I do. do you resolve to preach the gospel of Christ with constancy and fidelity? I do. do you resolve to guard the deposit of faith, entire and incorrupt, as handed down by the apostles and preserved in the church everywhere and at all times. I do. do you resolve to build up the body of Christ, his church, and to remain in the unity of that body, together with the order of bishops, under the authority of the successor of St. Peter the Apostle? I do. do you resolve to render obedience faithfully to the successor of the blessed Apostle Peter? Do you resolve to guide the holy people of God in the way of salvation as a devoted father and sustain them with the help of your fellow ministers, the priests and deacons? I do. Do you resolve for the sake of the Lord's name to be welcoming and merciful to the poor, to strangers, and to all who are in need? Do you resolve as a good shepherd to seek out the sheep who stray and gather them into the Lord's fold? I do. Do you resolve to pray without ceasing to Almighty God for the holy people and to carry out the office of high priest without reproach? I do. May God who has begun the good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. of Almighty God in providing for the welfare of the church will grant an abundance of his grace for this chosen one.
with your mercy the troubled and the afflicted. Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Strengthen all of us and keep us in your holy service. Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Jesus, Son of the hear our petitions, O Lord, and pour out upon this your servant the power of your blessing, flowing from the horn of priestly grace, through Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all consolation, who dwell on high and look upon the lowly, who know all things before they come to be, and who laid down observances in your church through the word of your grace, who from the beginning foreordained the nation of the just, born of Abraham, who established rulers and priests, and did not leave your sanctuary without ministers, 
and who from the foundation of the world were pleased to be glorified in those you have chosen. Pour out now upon this chosen one that power which is from you, the governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, the spirit whom he bestowed upon the holy apostles, who established the church in each place as your sanctuary for the glory and unceasing praise of your name. Grant, O Holy Father, knower of all hearts, that this your servant, whom you have chosen for the office of bishop, may shepherd your holy flock, serving you night and day. May he fulfill before you, without reproach, the ministry of the high priesthood, so that always gaining your favor, he may offer up the gifts of your holy church. Grant that by the power of the spirit of the high priesthood, he may have the power to forgive sins according to your command, assign offices according to your decree, and loose every bond according to the power given by you to the apostles. May he please you by his meekness and purity of heart, presenting a fragrant offering to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom glory and power and honor are yours with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever and ever. God, who has made you a sharer of the high priesthood of Christ, pour himself pour out upon you the oil of mystical anointing and make you fruitful with an abundance of spiritual blessings.
the gospel and preach the word of God with all patience and sound teaching. Receive this ring, the seal of fidelity, adorned with the undefiled faith, preserve the unblemished, the bride of God, the Holy Church. Amen. Receive the mitre and may the splendor of holiness shine forth in you so that when the chief shepherd appears, you may deserve to receive from him an unfading crown of glory. <laughs> Receive the crozier the sign of your pastoral office, and keep watch over the whole flock in which the Holy Spirit has placed you as bishop to govern the church of God.
my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, your Almighty Father. We offer you the sacrifice of praise, O Lord, for the deepening of our service of you, so that what you have conferred on us, unworthy as we are, you may graciously bring to fulfillment through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you made your only begotten Son, High Priest of the new and eternal covenant. And by your wondrous design, we're pleased to decree that this one priesthood should continue in church. For Christ not only adorns with a royal priesthood the people he has made his own, but with a brother's kindness, he also chose men to become sharers in his sacred mystery, ministry through the laying on of hands. They are to renew in his name the sacrifice of human redemption, to set before your children the Pascal banquet, to lead your holy people in charity, to nourish them with the word and strengthen them with the sacraments as they give up their life for you and for the salvation of their brothers and sisters, they strive to be conformed to the image of Christ himself and offer you a constant witness of faith and love. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks as an exaltation we acclaim. Merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world. Together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, I mean your unworthy servant, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and Apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you the sacrifice of praise for they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being, and paying you their homage, paying their homage to you, the eternal God living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, the blessed
blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damien, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of our, your holy family, also for me, which we make to you, also for me, your unworthy servant, whom you have been pleased to raise to the order of bishops. And in your mercy, keep safe your gifts in me, so that what I have received by divine commission, I may fulfill by divine assistance. Be pleased, O oh God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect, make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands. And with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said a blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. similar way when supper was ended he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands and once more giving you thanks he said a blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying take this all of you and drink from it for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant which we will pour out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants, and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gift that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and calmly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gift of your servant Abel to Joss, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, Command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angels to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through 
this participation of the altar, receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, that all who sleep in Christ a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who those sinners hope in your abundant mercy, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs. With John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and restore them upon us. Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord, I am not worthy to send you under my roof. But let me say the words that I have sold without being Shit. 
Let us pray.
my dear people, I've been asked to make some short comments at the close of this Mass, and I am delighted to do so. As you know, and as I know, for many, many years, Monsignor Jerome, now Bishop Jerome, has served the people of this diocese with distinction and with honor. He never shrank from any duty, and during my term as bishop, he never refused a single aspect of his assignment. He always made me so proud to be the bishop here by his goodness, by his kindness, and by his devotion and faith, devotion to and faith in Almighty God. And so today I stand here in this pulpit to ask you the favor of remembering him daily in your good prayers. Please remember him to our Blessed Mother and to all the saints in heaven, that they will guide him and help him as he fulfills the duty that he has sworn to undertake this day. May God richly bless you all and thank you very much. Your Eminence, Wilton Cardinal D. Gregory, Archbishop of Washington and Apostolic Administrator of the Diocese of St. Thomas up to the recent appointment. <laughs> Your Eminence, Sean Cardinal Patrick O'Malley, Archbishop of the good diocese of Boston. Your Excellency, the Apostolic Nuncio, Archbishop Christopher Pierre. Your Excellency, Bishop Emeritus Herbert Armstrong Bivar. Your Eminence, Cardinal Donald World. Reverend brothers and sisters, I'm blessed with the presence here today of our governor. and our Lieutenant Governor. The members of the legislature and all the public servants here this morning. As you can tell, I'm very, very moved by this celebration. This mass is being viewed live in many, many places in the world, thanks to EWTN and thanks to the crew that is working behind the camera and in the studio for live stream production. To you all, I say thank you. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, dear people of God, here present and all those listening or watching this mass via radio, television, or live stream. The Lord is good. All the times. His first letter to Timothy, St. Paul writes, I am grateful to him who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he considered me trustworthy in appointing me to the ministry. Please, brothers and sisters, I 
accept my gratitude. I am humble and grateful to His Holiness Pope Francis for the honor and the trust he placed in me by appointing me the sixth bishop of the Diocese of St. Thomas in the United States Virgin Islands. I am thankful to His Excellency Pierre Christophe, the Apostolic Nuncio, the representative of His Holiness Pope Francis in the United States of America. Your Excellency, please convey to His Holiness my gratitude and the excitement of the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands upon receiving the message of my appointment. Also, reassure him of our continuous prayers for him and his pastoral undertakings. I take this opportunity to express my profound gratitude to His Eminence Cardinal Wilton Gregory for their support, his support and the support of the people of Washington, the Archdiocese of Washington. When our Bishop, Bishop Biva, had to undergo treatment of Allen, he stepped in and helped us a great deal. Your Eminence, you appointed me as your delegate. That choice is indeed a sign of confidence you place in me. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for your prayers and assistance. Your Eminence Cardinal Wall, over the years you have assisted the Diocese of St. Thomas in a variety of ways, responding to our urgent needs and making my previous bishop and myself feel at home in the Archdiocese of Washington. On behalf of the Diocese of St. Thomas, thank you. His eminent son, Cardinal Patrick O'Malley. What can I say? I do not intend to keep you here the whole day, brothers and sisters, but there is so much to say about this mentor of mine. The Lord has placed you on my way since I first came to the United States. You were and continue to be the one who encouraged me to listen to the voice of the Lord and to do His will. Eli was a special mentor in the life of Samuel. You have been and continue to be Eli, Eli in my life. Thank you for always being there for me. Birthdays, birthdays and ordination cards for over 30 years without missing one year. So thank you. I don't know if you remember the day you picked me up from the cathedral, St. Matthew Cathedral, where I was doing my after school job. You asked me to drive you. I have never received a driver's license. <laughs> but I managed to get a, a student driver's license, a student, so I was learning. But he trusted me enough to ask me to drive him and he was to my right as we took the curve on the 15th Street, shortly after St. Augustine Church near the park, he realized that the car was going the other way out of the road. You should have seen him taking the wheel and some, the steering wheel and you know, turning the, the, the car to the street. I will remember. For, I will remember that day up to now, Bishop. How could you trust this guy who never drove to drive you? <laughs> you did it. Not only that, that green 
Dodge, Dark Dodge. It was an old car, we repaired it so many times, but he turned that car over to me. And before I moved into the seminary, I turned that car over to that gentleman sitting right there. And it became a taxi for him to earn his living as a student in Washington, D.C. To earn his living as a student in Washington, D.C. So thank you for that. I could go on and on and on and on. You remember the day you took me for the first time to a restaurant? I've never been to a restaurant since I arrived in Washington, D.C. You just said to me, come. I didn't know where we were going. And before I realized I entered this place, it was written in front of the door, pizzeria. When I entered there, the kind of food that they brought was pizza. I've never eaten pizza in my life. <laughs> And so, you made me taste my first pizza, and you made me, you made me also go to the first Ro Rogers restaurant. So thank you. I was not the only one. We have many seminarians coming from different third world countries. You managed to create a community house for all of us. So on behalf of all those brothers and sisters, thank you. My sincere appreciation goes out to our previous bishops, Bishop Elliot Thomas, whose love and dedication, as well as his yearning for peace and unity among the people of our territory, has taught us what it means to be a compassionate pastor. Pastor of souls in today's world. I thank God for bringing people like him in our lives to the late Bishop Josh V. Murray. I pray that God extend his mercy upon him and welcome him into paradise. We all hold him a great debt of gratitude. He gave such, so much of his time and intellect to our diocese. He really put me to work, brothers and sisters. Under him, I was appointed chaplain of His Holiness by His Holiness John Paul II. As if it was not enough, he assigned me to many diocesan duties. To His Excellency Bishop Herbert Duval, since your appointment as our bishop, you have instruct, entrusted me with so many responsibilities that help and shape me to be the man that I am today. Thank you for your advice and guidance over the years. You will always be remembered. May God continue to strengthen you during your well-deserved retirement. My gratitude, I come back to you, Governor, goes out to you. Thank you for your leadership here. I remember the day you were here, the inaugural mass that we celebrated here for you. I ask God to grant you the spirit that you needed as you were about to lead the people of the Virgin Islands. You have done your best. Your, your time has been a very difficult time. But somehow, you have navigated through all that, leading the people of the Virgin Islands with the support, the unquestionable, the unquestionable support of your assistant, the uh, lieutenant governor, and all the public servants here in the Virgin Islands. Special note to our healthcare department. We have a wonderful healthcare department. And every single person who came here, and many people came here, they didn't just walk into the Virgin Islands, they have to go to the portal. They have to go and sign up and make sure that, you know, we verify whether or not they have been tested and they are ready to come to the Virgin Islands. Not only my guests, but all the guests to the Virgin Islands. Thank you for taking those steps to protect the lives of the people of the Virgin Islands. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Yes, 
I personally thank you for your work of love in our territory. I pledge my support and the support, the continuous support of the Catholic community as you lead the people of the Virgin Islands in ways pleasing to God. I am sincerely grateful to the many friends and families who opened their hearts and welcomed me here in the Virgin Islands. You know who you are. If you are beginning to name, to name you, the listing will never be complete. God knows you and knows the impact that you have made in my life. My prayer rises us like an incense to God for each one of you. Through your hospitality, through your cooperation, you have paved and smoothed the way for what I consider to be a rewarding ministry in this, our territory. With you by my side, I have been able to accomplish what alone, without divine aid and your support, I could never have accomplished. The journey has been tough and challenging, but you have been there for me. Our Lord Jesus Christ has been faithful to us. God is good all the time. The Lord has truly been our portion in happiness and our chalice in sorrow. Please, as we look ahead, let us continue to beg our good Lord to guide us and watch over us, helping us to persevere in fidelity and love for the years ahead, which I pray will be many and fruitful. Somebody may say he did not say anything concerning his family. My family is represented here. I owe you a great debt of gratitude. When I left Cameroon, because of your expectations, you wanted me, and because of my training back then, you wanted me to go and further my studies in accounting. You expected me to be an, accounting, an accountant, but I decided to count the souls of the Lord and to take care of the souls of the Lord. So, And I know that you have given up because you realize that I have chosen the best part. So thank you for that and thank you for your support. The presence of so many of you here is a clear indication of your love for me, of your support for my ministry. So thank you. As for you who are watching this mass on television in Cameroon, in France, in everywhere in the world, and also for those who are in St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. John, and Water Island, you are my brothers and sisters. I know that you are waiting for me on the island of St. Croix. I cannot wait till I get there. And I know that you're waiting for me on the island of St. John. I look forward to meeting you there. So thank you for your love. Thank you for your patience with me. Today, the entire ceremony has been a vivid affirmation of my profession of faith and a vivid reminder of my Episcopal duties, inter, the, uh, duties to preach, to teach, to sanctify, and to govern. Pray with me and for me that I tend my sheep in ways pleasing to God. And so, brothers and sisters, Thank you. I also like to thank all those who made it possible for us to be here today. Many people are working behind the scene. And because of them, <laughs> as I said earlier, the listing is a long listing. And I know you and, you, and I know what you have been involved in. I pray that God continue to bless you as you 
participate in the life of the church as you help me carry out my duties in ways pleasing to God. May God bless you and see you very, very soon. of holy flock may come to eternal joy for its shepherds. As in your majestic power, you are Lord the number of our days and the measure of your year of our years. Look favorably upon our humble service and confer on our time the abundance of your peace. Amen. Give a happy outcome to the task that you, through your grace, you have laid upon me, whom you have raised to the rank of bishop. Make me pleasing to you in the fulfillment of my duties and to guide the hearts of people and pastors that the obedience of the flock may never fail the shepherd, nor the care of the shepherd be lacking for the flock. And may Almighty God bless who are, who are gathered here, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.